Hi everyone. So today we have Alejandro Viloria with us and he's going to tell us about enriching diagrams with algebraic operation. Please take it away. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so today we'll be talking about um, doing the work with Henning Basalt and Alfonso Lerman. So in this paper, uh, we introduced an extension of the stretch calculus uh, using algebras and their monads to reason about uh, probabilistic uh, operations using CEREX. So I'm gonna give you first uh, a bit of motivation as to why we did this and a very brief overview of how we did it and how does it look like. And then we are going to go through the bit of the category theory that uh, supports this extension. Then I'm going to show you how to, I'm going to show you how the diagrams or what, how we call them enriched diagrams look like. And then I will give a simple example of how we can reason about uh, quantum error mitigation techniques uh, using uh, this enriched ZX. So the main idea for this project was to reason about noise in quantum circuits using ZX calculus. And um, there is a message in the chat. Oh, okay, yeah. And um, as you know, a CEREX calculus is universal and complete in the sense that it can represent any linear map or any completely positive map. And it can prove any true equation, but sometimes a uh, representations of certain operations, uh, when you inspect them visually, uh, they don't really reveal what, uh, what is going on in there. So it's harder to reason about. So uh, what we want uh, then is to create an extension of, of CEREX in which we can uh, reason about probabilistic processes in diagrammatic form. So we want a sort of operation, like a weighted sum, in which uh, we can say that uh, if we have some diagram D1 and some diagram D2, uh, and they are mixed using some binary operation plus P here, then uh, this is uh, we apply the weight P to D1 and weight one minus P to D2 and then we can extend this to arbitrary convex sums. We also then want uh, to have all the expected rewrite rules that uh, shows you how these uh, probability distributions interact between them, uh, then sequential composition, tensor product, how we can, for example, if we swap uh, the one with the two, then we have to negate the probability. So we write one minus p instead. We can remove a, a, pro, a diagram that has weight zero, etc. So for this, uh, what we do is uh, create a construction that basically takes a graphical language for monodal categories. In this case, uh, we use ZX. And uh, what we do is enclose it in between uh, two brackets that we represent here as uh, these blue trapezoids. So uh, we read diagrams here from top to bottom. And uh, what we say is that a uh, juxtaposition of diagrams when inside these uh, trapezoids is not the tensor product, but is this is the this this mixture of diagrams. We allow also weight on the wires when when inside of this uh, environment. And then uh, we also allow to to write regular CEREX diagrams in this language, so we don't really uh, if. If you write a regular CEREX diagram, then uh, you can reason about this just as a trivial distribution over a, a single diagram. So with this, you can have, for example, a quantum circuit with uh, deterministic operations that you do, and then at some point add a layer of noise, and you use uh, this kind of uh, generators. Otherwise, you just use regular CEREX. And then we also add a set of rewrite rules. So I'm going to uh, quickly explain a bit uh, how we come to this using category theory. I know that you're uh, already a bit familiar with category theory, so i try to be quick. So just as a refresher, um, we have a uh, monodal categories, which are categories with tensor product and a unit object, together with some associators and unitors. And if we take a, if we take a monodal category, then we can enrich a category over it. This means that if we have some uh, monodal category V, uh, then we can define a, an enriched V category or V enriched category C underline. This is how we represent 
enrich categories using this underline here, where we have a, some collection of objects. And for each pair of objects A and B, instead of having a set of morphisms between these objects, then what we have is an object of B. So uh, we use the, the objects of B as the, as the morphisms between A and B. Um, I think someone uh, has a question or said something. No, sorry, that was me joining and Zoom being weird. Ah, okay. Yeah. So um, we need a monodal structure here so we can define the, the composition, but uh, we don't need to get that much into detail. And we call the monodal category that we use to to enrich some category C as the base of enrichment. So for example, we have a locally small categories they are called set enriched because all the morphisms form a set. We have, for example, the category of vector spaces for some field K and Kronecker product. Then a V enriched categories for V being the category of vector spaces are the categories where the morphisms form a vector space. And for example, you can say that this category is enriched over itself because these linear maps also form a vector space. Uh, we also have that, for example, if uh, you have the category of uh, metric spaces, then a category enriched over it is, uh, is one where you can have a notion of distance in it. And now uh, what we do is, uh, we take these categories and we group them into two categories. So a two, a two category is basically a category that has some objects and a category of a, so for every pair of objects, we have a category here, which is visually represented uh, as something like this, where we have uh, some objects and then we have one cells and two cells and this form a category. So we can say another example that a two category or where more precisely a strict two category is also enriched over cut. And then uh, we have that uh, for any symmetric monoidal category, then uh, categories enriched over it together with enriched functors and enriched natural transformations all form a uh, two category of, en of V enriched categories. And what we're going to do is take, a, for example, set X or take a categories in which we interpret set X calculus and do what we call a change of enrichment. So a change of enrichment is basically if you have a monoidal functor between two monoidal categories, then a, this monoidal functor can actually, I uh, see that someone raised their hand. Yes. Oh. So I just missed the last bit about VCAT or like the last, like, I mean, it's important. It seems like an important definition. Yeah, so here I'm saying that basically if you have a, so all in enriched categories together with enriched functors and natural transformations, they can be to, they can be grouped together into what we call VCAT. So these are the category of enriched categories over V, over some monoidal category V. V functors, the, the functors in the V enriched categories, or is it what it is? Yeah, so these are uh, en enriched functors. So okay. Called v enriched functors, yes. Okay. But uh, these are not very important, so I prefer not to just uh, don't, don't define them here. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, so if you have some uh, monoidal functor, between two bases of enrichment, so uh, between two monoidal categories, then uh, you can actually think of it as a functor between two bases of enrichment, which means that uh, you can lift a functor F to a two functor F star between uh, some V1 cut and V2 cut. So you can uh, take a category that is enriched over V1 and transform it into a category enriched over V2. And the process is quite simple. So basically, uh, you, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but basically the objects are the same. We uh, leave the objects as they are. And the morphisms, you just apply F to the home object because F uh, goes from V1 to V2 and the object 
for the big one category is uh, not taking big one, so you can just apply F. And then we also have composition and the identity element are defined in this way, but these are not that important. So for example, um, we have uh, some, some B and uh, this functor that takes the some object in V and, and return the set of objects the set of morphisms between the the unit of the tensor product to that object goes from B to Z. And this, uh, when you lift it, it allows you to define the underlying category functor, which uh, basically goes from a V enriched category to a set enriched category in the same way as we saw earlier. We lift the objects as, as themselves and the home objects, we just plug them here. Another example is a for free algebra over a monad, which is what we're going to do later. So actually we're going to, to say it now. First, I'm going to quickly uh, remind what a monad is. So a uh, monad, you can think of it as uh, three things. You have an end of functor. So a functor between a category and itself. A multiplication natural transformation and um, a unit such that uh, well the multiplication is associative and the unit is the unit for the multiplication. Now when you have some monad D uh, you can uh, construct this what we call the Ellenberg Moore category of it or also the category of algebras which objects are just the are, are the objects of, of C together with a, what we call a T action that a, lets you, let's say, evaluate the monad. So it goes from TA to A. And the morphisms are a, algebra preserving a, morphisms. So you just take the, the same morphisms from A to B, but you, you make them commute with the algebra. And uh, you can have that uh, every monad is defined as a pair of functors between the category it works on and its island more category. So you can have these two functors, U and L. Now, these are the monads that we are going to be using today. So for example, the distribution monad is a monad on set that uh, takes a set A and maps it to the set of finally supported probability distributions over elements of A. So uh, these finally supported probability distributions, we represent, we represent them as complex sums, so, uh, sorry, as convex sums that we see here, such that, uh, well, uh, the weights are between zero and one, and they sum up to one. The unit for the monad takes a, an element of A and returns the Dirac distribution, so the trivial distribution over that element. And the multiplication allows you to collapse a probability distribution of probability distributions into just one by just multiplying everything and summing all the, all the elements around. Another example that is very similar to the distribution monad is the multiset monad that a maps a set A instead of a a convex combinations, just formal linear combinations of elements of A. We can see it's here with the unit and multiplication being uh, similar to the distribution monad. Now, um, a particularly well behaved uh, monad for our case would be a monad that interacts well with the monoidal structure. So if you have some monoidal category V and a monad on it, you say that the monad is monoidal or sometimes also referred to as commutative. If you have for every object A and B of V, uh, you have some map NABLA that uh, lets you take the monad outside of the tensor product. And we also say that a monad that, uh, that takes the terminal object and gives an element that is isomorphic to the terminal object, we call it a fine. And for example, the distribution monad is both, both these things. So we can have a pair of probability distributions and we can map it uh, by just uh, taking the probability distributions outside of the 
the staple and multiplying all the weights together. Now, uh, what we're going to do next is we're going to use the category of algebras for this distribution monad and use it as a base of enrichment for CEREX calculus and for the categories that we interpret the CEREX calculus with. So we need uh, this category to be monoidal. And luckily, uh, we have that monoidal monads in, under some conditions uh, give uh, this monoidal structure on the category of algebras. So uh, this, this lemma here just tells us that uh, the underlying category factor that uh, I referred to earlier, so this V that takes an, an element of uh, V and returns the set of morphisms between I and, and that element has some left adjoint F, <clears throat> and that this, this both uh, actually form an adjunction and a two adjunction here. So you can actually also go from B enriched categories to set enriched categories uh, back and forth using these two functors. And what we can do here is just, I have underlined here the important part. You have a monoidal monad T on set, which is particularly well behaved here allows you to directly plug a, the category of algebras into this definition here in the lemma above, which means that uh, you can take uh, the category of algebras and, and use it to, to freely enrich categories and have an adjunction between it and the underlying category factor in the case that the free, that the free factor that defines the, uh, the monad is isomorphic to this F here. So what is important here is just to keep in mind that uh, well, we are enriching a category over algebras for the monad, and but we also want to keep the monadal structure. So we still want to take these CEREX diagrams that are enriched and be able to compose them in parallel too. So also, uh, we show that uh, this can be done. So if you have uh, a set of, uh, <clears throat> sorry, if you have an adjunction here like this, and these categories turn out to also be monoidal then or symmetric monoidal, then this symmetric monoidal structure is preserved. And with with this, it, it allows you to basically uh, take the category of strix diagrams, take in this case, we use the category of completely positive maps, and enrich it using the algebras for the distribution model. So I can ask a question here. I'm a yes. bit surprised that this F functor would just work with symmetric model structure, but maybe I missed a special property that F has to have when there is model structure there. Or does it mm. just work because set is monoidal in a very specific way? No, so F in this case, uh, well, this is, uh, this from the uh, textbook from Bursu. And yes, apparently it works because, well, F here maps a, and a set X to, to a, a X fold co power of the noidal unit here. But so this probably then follows because co products distribute over tensor products or something like that, so monoidal or. Um... That's that's we take the monoidal structure of sets to be this co-product or something like that. No, we take the monoidal structure of set as being just the Cartesian product. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Um. Yeah. Uh, I, I I can believe that there's some details here that maybe yeah are in a book. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, and now with this, uh, we take Cx. We take. CPM, and I'm going to explain now, and just enrich over, uh, over the algebras for the distribution mona using this construction here. So I'm sure you are all familiar with strix diagrams and their interpretation together with the rewrite rules. So I'm just putting this here for completeness. And if someone has a question, uh, you can ask. 
but basically, uh, well, you can take the stress diagrams, but also use use them for reasoning about completely positive maps and the city matrices. So uh, what we use here is what uh, Titun Karet and co-authors did, which is basically take the take the graphical calculus of CEREX diagrams and add an extra generator, which is the, the discard. And uh, these three rate rules that we can see here that tells you that, well, you can discard in a isometry and that a uh, global phase is also cancel out and interpret a uh, stretch diagrams into the category of completely, completely positive maps. The interpretation changes a bit because now uh, it's a super operator. So basically it takes some quantum state uh, raw and maps it just to the, you multiply it from the left and from the right with the standard interpretation and from the right you use the dagger. Now, uh, what we do is then take the category of completely completely positive maps and we enrich it freely over the category of algebras. And we get uh, some category that uh, has the same objects as CPM and the morphisms are basically uh, formal convex combinations of completely positive maps with the ability of collapsing uh, two layers of distributions into one. But also, uh, if you think about it, a, a category of completely positive maps is already enriched over algebras for distribution monad in the sense that if you have a convex combination of completely positive maps, then uh, this is again a completely, completely positive map. And uh, lastly, we take now the category of strix diagrams and we do the enrichment too. So uh, we take the we get the category of enriched stretch diagrams. And I'm going to show now how it, how it how it looks like. So we construct the category of freely enriched stretch diagrams as follows. So the objects are going to be the same, just the just the wires, the number of wires, and diagrams are formal convex sums of stretch diagrams. So these formal convex sums, uh, we use a graphical representation. Uh, that is uh, what I showed at the beginning of the presentation in which we take the generators of the strix calculus and we wrap them around uh, these blue trapezoids that represent uh, a probability distribution. So what is inside of, the, of these bracketed diagrams represents a mixture of diagrams. Uh, this is the image that I showed earlier. So what we have is a input from the top, output from the bottom. In this case, we have a one input, one output uh, system in which uh, we have two choices uh, that we apply. So we apply D1 with probability P and D2 with probability one minus P. But of, well, of course we can have a uh, more than one choice here. And uh, now I'm going to show how, how it works with uh, more complex diagrams. But now, just with this, uh, we can represent, for example, a completely, sorry, a depolarizing noise channel. It basically tells us that with probability one minus P, we apply the identity. And with equal probability P thirds, we can apply some X error, some Y error, or some Z error to the quantum system. Now, more generally, these uh, enriched CEREX diagrams look like this. So as I said earlier, uh, technically all of them have to be wrapped around this, uh, this, uh, tra these blue trapezoids. But uh, we also allow uh, for regular CEREX diagrams as we can say that these are just the trivial distribution over them. Now, uh, what we have inside, uh, we can have an arbitrary mixture of CEREX diagrams. So the number of inputs and outputs of the diagrams that are inside of the mixture must coincide. And the probabilities have to sum up to one. So uh, one of the few restrictions that we have. And the juxtaposition uh, means a sum. But uh, as you can see, it also means tensor product 
So the way to distinguish if you have two wires in parallel, if it's a sum or a tensor product, what you do is you trace them back to the beginning or to the end of the of the, tra of the trapezoids. And if they come from the same origin, then they are in tensor product, otherwise they are in, in sum. Now we allow weight on the wires. And uh, yeah, in here, we just put the weight on the outermost wire, but of course you can move the weight around <clears throat> as long as they, you keep it inside of the wires that are in the same mix. So for example, you can put P1 either in any of these end first wires, but you cannot move it to the to the next ones. Now, uh, if you have scalars in this uh, arbitrary diagram, C1 to the K, uh, what, what you do uh, is basically you either put it on the weight and what you have then is a linear combination. Uh, we can also have linear combinations of stretch diagrams. So what we did with the distribution monad also works with the multiset monad. Or alternatively, you can have some special wire that also connects to the same origin where the, where the diagram is uh, multiplying the rest of the diagrams. I'm gonna give you an example later. <clears throat> so we can have sequential composition of diagrams as usual. Uh, we have some diagram that goes from N to M and another from M to R, then we just put them together by connecting the inputs and outputs. Parallel composition works similarly. Uh, you can uh, put them in parallel by just uh, juxtaposing two diagrams. And uh, I also want to mention that uh, you can also use uh, some different notation for a stronger uh, visual separation of uh, the scalars. So for example, uh, this work by Tobias Stolenberg and co-authors did some some formal definition of addition of, of ZX diagrams by wrapping them with some bubbles here. This, this allows you to uh, visualize how the, for example, the scalars cannot leave the bubbles. But in this case, uh, what we do is just something that is a bit less uh, visually cluttered. And uh, yes, another way would be uh, what uh, Duncan did for one paper on generalized proof nets, which is also have uh, some separation boxes and this represent a uh, sum and you can basically uh, mix them together as, as many as you want, which also separates them uh, visually. So this is how we interpret uh, these enriched ZX diagrams. What we do is uh, take, uh, take some arbitrary enriched ZX diagram and just uh, interpret it as a sum, a weighted sum of all the interpretations of the individual ZX diagrams that can be inside. This can be defined uh, basically as a composition of functors that goes from an enriched series diagram to the category of freely enriched uh, completely positive maps. And then you evaluate, the, evaluate this probability distribution again as a completely positive map itself. Uh, we also come up with some rewrite rules that, that are what you would expect how these uh, sums behave. Basically, if you have some composition of probability distributions, then you can distribute the, the inner uh, diagrams inside and combine them. You can also do the same for the tensor product. So if you have a tensor product of two probability distributions, you can uh, put them together. Um, just to be clear, in this first equation on the left, mm -hmm. that should be like it's also like squaring number of operations, right? So if you have, you will have like m times n number of boxes on the right hand side there. Mm -hmm. No, so um, 
So here, uh, there is a difference between the input or input wires that you can have and the number of elements. Oh, of the um, sorry, I mean K and L. So there will be K times L number of boxes on the right-hand side here. Right? Yes. Mm. Okay. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, some other rewrite rules would be to, for example, you can basically change the order of, of the the sum. If you have a trivial sum, then you are allowed to just write the diagram itself. So you can have just select diagrams as they are. If you have two similar, uh, two identical diagrams that are in different branches, then you just combine them by adding the probabilities and you can delete one one diagram that has weight zero. Or if the diagram itself is zero, you can also delete it. And now what, uh, what we do is uh, take these enriched diagrams and, and study a quantum error mitigation technique with it, which I'm going to show now. So quantum error mitigation uh, are the techniques that we use to reduce the effects of the coherence in NISC devices. So at least in the near term, you can expect them to be part of the necessary stack to run experiments on real quantum computers. And symmetry verification is one such technique of quantum error mitigation. So the symmetry verification works as follows. You have some Hamiltonian H and a symmetry S. We say that S is a symmetry if S commutes with H. And if you have that the initial state before the Hamiltonian is a plus one eigenvector of S, then if at some point of your computation, there is an error that anti-commutes with S, then you can detect it by, me by measuring S at any point in the circuit. Then what a symmetry verification uh, tells you to do is Basically, you can do these uh, S measurements at some point in the circuit or just at the end. And if you find that, uh, that the eigenvalues that you had at the beginning changed, it means that there was an error and you are allowed to discard this system entirely. So for example, if we have some uh, noisy state or noisy and asymmetry S, the probability of having outcome plus one when measuring S is defined by the trace of the projector to the to the state. And this value is what tells you is the probability that the symmetry accepts a noisy state. So for example, if um, for given a Hamiltonian, you can have uh, multiple symmetries. So if you want to, to decide which symmetry you want to use in your circuit, then uh, this is a way of doing it you know how your noise model looks like, you can see a, which it has the lowest probability of accepting an, a noisy state and use that uh, symmetry. Yeah, and this way you decide which symmetry works best. Now, uh, what we do then is take the take this concept and, and test it on a simple circuit using the, the polarizing noise channel and uh, we perform the, the calculation diagrammatically. So uh, what we do is, well, we start with an ideal state until noise, in this case, just get plus. And we say that, for example, we want to apply a depolarizing noise channel, which is represented by what we look like, what we look here. Then a, a symmetry measurement is just basically a Hadamard test on on X, we here we are measuring X. And if we combine these uh, diagrams together and then we do the trace at the end, what we calculate is what is the probability of this measurement accepting a, a noisy state that was uh, under this uh, noisy channel. And notice that we are using here arbitrary probabilities P. So we don't have to give a P a probability in order to reason about how well this works. Intuitively, well, you can see that if you measure X, 
then X commutes with identity and X commutes with uh, the second branch also, which is um, an X error. But X anti commutes with the second and um, sorry with the third and fourth branch. So this means that, uh, that technically uh, the third and fourth branch shouldn't uh, <clears throat> shouldn't contribute to this um, to this result to this probability because this in theory this asymmetry measurement will detect these errors because it anti commutes. So we take the diagrams, we compose them together. And uh, we just start simplifying them. So we, sim we can simplify the symmetry measurement by just a post selection as it gets also removed by the by the trace at the end. And we can pull all the all the diagrams outside of the trapezoids inside. So we get a convex combination of scalars and the scalar diagram. So I'm writing here, uh, these are not Hadamard edges. These are uh, these discontinuous edges here are basically a way of, of telling you that, okay, you don't have a wire here, but these are separated as the, these are not in tensor product, these are in some form. Then if you, well, if you simply uh, simplify all this, what, what you get is a diagram that looks like this at the end. And uh, the zero input, zero output by a spider it has an um, interpretation of zero. So this means that indeed the last two branches uh, and they commute with the symmetry and would give you a, a it, the error would be detected. So the, the weights, the two weights p thirds that we have here do not, uh, won't be counted. So if you then uh, calculate this, you, you give a uh, one minus two P, o, two P over three, which is indeed what you would expect. So um, in the end, what we did is take this, um, this method of constructing enriched symmetric monoidal categories over the algebras for uh, some monads on set. In this case, we use the distribution monad, but uh, other monads also follow, for example, the multiset monad. You can also grab, for example, the power set mode, the non-empty power set monad. And this would allow you, for example, to, to reason about uh, someone else doing an operation that you don't know that it would occur at some point in your computation. So it's just a choice, not probabilistic or not in, not in some form. It's just a, a different choice of, of diagrams. We embed this into ZX, so we can reason about probabilistic quantum processes, and uh, we use it to, to reason about quantum mitigation techniques. So uh, the idea is to use this not only for quantum error mitigation, but for example, to reason about how noise changes uh, the trace distance between the, the ideal state that you have and the, and the noise state that you will get at the end or uh, for processes like quantum circuit uh, post-processing, which is, for example, if you have a quantum circuit that is too large for you to compute, you can cut it into pieces and then uh, sum all the pieces up and you cut it by doing measurements at some point of the circuit. So you can also represent this using this uh, construction. Now, in terms of completeness, uh, what I'm working on right now is to translate these trapezoids into this work by uh, Margarita Esquesorova, uh, Manuel Jandel, and Simon Pedri, in which they they define this addition of Serex diagrams using vanilla Serex calculus. And what they do is uh, turn every diagram into a controlled form, and then they show a way of how to sum diagrams that are in controlled form. So since you can apply all the rules of Serex calculus inside of uh, each diagram, within the trapezoids, you can turn this into a controlled form and this just substitute these trapezoids by these constructions that they have. So that's what I'm working on right now. And uh, yes, these are the references and I will take questions now. 
Right. Uh, thank you very much, Alejandro. Um, if you want to thank the speaker using the clap emoji thing on Zoom. Um, right, so do we have any any questions from the audience? Uh, yes, I have a question about um, using this way of um, tracking the probability distribution in your quantum processes. Uh, well, firstly, thank you very much for the talk. Um, I wonder, so you were talking about assuming an error model and then you can see what is the probabilistic outcome by tracking like how the Pauli's or like the errors is propagating. Are you able to use this to kind of define a cost function so that you could use it to compare a uh, different compiling strategy or optimization strategy? And by cost function, I meant your way of quantifying the noise in the system or the quality of your computation. Yeah, so if I understand the question correctly, uh, for example, there are some quantum circuit optimization techniques that, uh, for example, trade a control node gates with Hadamard gates, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, so uh, what you can do is, for example, attached to every gate that you have uh, some noise channel to it. And then uh, you can see the trace dots that, well, you might prefer to apply this gate that has a different noise channel because in the end it propagates less through the circuit or it cancels out at some point. Mm -hmm. And you can use these rewrite rules for it. And then you then this way sure. you can see uh, which gates you would prefer to apply. Sorry, which rewrite rule are you talking about? Well, in general, the rewrite rules that uh, we have here, what uh, let you do is distribute a noise or a probability distributions in general. So, for example, if you have a noise channel here. I don't know if you can, can you see my cursor. So if yeah. you have some some noise channel uh, here composed by imagine that this is instead of just a deterministic quantum gate, well you can use this rule just to pull it in inside and it might cancel out the noise at some point. So can I understand that suppose we are looking at one time size of a noisy circuit and this time size can be composed of a two qubit gate idle qubits, meaning that we have T1, T2 time, or some noisy, uh, like single qubit gate. And then you can assume different error channel for different type of gate. And then you can use this rewrite rules to combine them together so that you can have a, like a comprehensive uh, description of what is actually happening in this one time size. Mm -hmm. Composite rule of different error models. Yeah, so, I think in this case you would have to compose the so so you mean that you have different error models and you want to compare how you perform depending on on them. Right? No, I'm talking more about if you have a complicated circuit that has different types of errors. Now it's not reasonable to use just one error model to for all gates. It's better to kind of assume different error models. Mm -hmm. My question yeah. is how to compose them and you know how to have comprehensive account of a more complicated circuit. Yeah, exactly. So uh, usually when you have some some set of quantum gates, if you look at some specification of a quantum computer, uh, you have the errors that come up with each gate. So what you can do is after each gate, add a layer of noise. This is usually how, how this is done. Oh, so you're assuming every gate or every noisy channel occupy precisely one time size and you're doing horizontal composition of your noisy channels, right? You're not doing vertical compositions. Well, you can take a, well, depends on the noise model that you want to, to model here. You can both model a single qubit noise, but also two qubit or n qubit noise channels. Oh, I see. But but what if you have a C naught, a noisy C naught, and a noisy Toffoli? Oh, that's crazy. But like, assume that it lives in one time size. Then how are you gonna do it? So 
you have a three qubit system, uh, C not gate in, in two qubits. So see if you understand correctly. So you have a uh, some C not gate, right? Uh -huh. And then uh, where where do you put the toffoli? What do you mean? Exactly. Yeah, like and then vertically you have another complicated gate. Some gate here. Yeah. I I you mean com compose vertically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, uh Usually, you you take the specific well if you take the specification of the C node and this would come with some noise attached, and you can do is then compose uh, some some noise channel. Uh huh. It says well with probability something you have the identity and with some probability you have an error e. Right. Yeah. And here you would have a, a different noise channel attached to the to the toffoli. Mm -hmm. And and that's when they they you come combine this for example with this rewrite rule here, oh. and, you, and you can push uh, things inside. I see. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions from the audience? Otherwise, I have one. Yes. Hey. Right. <clears throat> so. Um, you talked about completeness a bit at the end. Um, I just want to point out that if you have this way of introducing sums into your diagrams, this usually trivializes the question of completeness because what you can do is if you have an identity wire, you can replace this by a sum of two disconnected components, namely sort of uh, cat bra zero zero and cat bra one one. You make a sum of those two things, which is the identity. So that every identity can be replaced by a sum of two disconnected things. So then if I have a diagram, then wherever there's a connection between two spiders, I can replace it by this sum structure of two disconnected things. And that means then if I push out all these sum things using this using the, the, these distribution rules, I get a really big sum over all these disconnected little diagram components, which are just scalars. So then essentially I get a sum over scalars and I can just sum those up using the regular algebra of real numbers. And then this gives you me this gives me a normal form, but the normal form is literally just the matrix of the diagram. Um, so that's usually the way that you sort of trivialize completeness um, when you have these things with sums. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I just want to point out that so if you, if you add a rule like that, identity is equal to a disconnected sum, then probably you get completeness. Okay, it's interesting. Thank you. Um, so uh, another question would be, um, so if you have a ZX diagram, uh, the reason we can write this as a string diagram is because we know this preserves the, uh, the semantics, right? If I move stuff around in the plane, it will still represent the same linear map because these are the axioms of a complex closed right. category. But if I'm correct, this, this is not the case with these, these generators you wrote here, right? These, um, these in and out boxes, because there I can't just move stuff around because... Um, like for instance, the scalar i you drew, like this number i in the um, the uh, powder decoherence channel, uh, that actually belongs to one specific branch. You can't really move this i around as a scalar. Is that yeah, correct? So, yeah. So in this case, uh, these coherence axioms for non-modal categories apply individually to each branch. Mm -hmm. And if you want to to have this to be coherent, then you have to make some restrictions. And in this case, we say, well, that the scalars are bound to the to the wires. Or that, yeah. a, as a shown here, for example, uh, if you have a scalar diagram, instead, you can a, you allow yourself to have some, say, identity wire, an identity in the sense of the monoidal unit that, mm -hmm. a, that is bound to the, to the trapezoid. Yeah. So you have to put some restriction. Otherwise, then yes, you can move things around and you you break it. So um, I don't know if you've encountered sheet diagrams in uh, your readings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in, in the in the paper, we mentioned also these sheet diagrams and the uh, tape diagrams that also do something similar, mm -hmm. in which they talk about instead of enriched categories, they use these uh, rich categories, right? So in. Sorry. Cliff, 
what did you say? Uh, rig category. So a category is with uh, rig. Oh, yeah. To, to tensor products. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, because then you can actually separate out these um, different branches of the diagram onto different sheets, and they still then sort of. It's it's all clear what operations are allowed in the sense you can't just move stuff between two sheets because you have to go via these these splitters, right? And mm -hmm. then your blue box will be splitters. But like I I, I typesetting these things is terrible. So I, I I would understand if you want to restrict the two dimensions. Yeah, in that case you have to use three dimensions. Yeah, I think there is a a, a text package that allows you to do this, um, or it it might have been developed specifically for the sheet diagrams.